right, let's now talk about the basic concepts behind convolutional neural networks. So I showed you this figure before. It's from an article you can find here if you're interested. Um, I thought that was actually a very nice um, summary figure of the different assumptions that neural networks make. So for instance, the multilayer perceptron assumes that the features are independent. So that's the basic assumption behind the multilayer perceptron architecture. I just see Actually, this should be um, fully connected, usually in a um, fully connected or multilayer perceptron. Anyways, so um, another one is that we have a time dependency or sequence. And that is something we will talk about when we talk about the recurrent neural networks. So if you think about text, so here we have essentially a sequence dependency if you want to analyze text from left to right or something like that or you want to do stock market predictions or something where you have a se sequential component to the data that would be something for recurrent neural networks for convolutional neural networks we have this locality assumption so this is what we are going to talk about and specifically this is for two-dimensional convolutional networks. You can technically also use uh, one-dimensional uh, convolutional networks to analyze text, but here we are going to focus on the two-dimensional case for simplicity, that is image analysis. So here, imagine this is our input image here, and how or what the convolutional network is doing, it's assuming essentially that these patches here, the, um, the pixels in a certain neighborhood, they are connected to each other, or they are related to each other. And that makes sense. So for instance, if I draw a face as let's say my, my image, you know that if you take this region, these are all the pixels for the eye that have a relationship to each other. So in that way, um, these pixels here in the eye region, they are not independent. They have some, yeah, some local dependency, right? So, and that is what the CNN is trying to capture. So here is an illustration of one of the earliest convolutional neural networks. At least that's the one I think that was the first published version of it. So this is um, here by Jan Le Kuhn and co-authors uh, back in 1989. So that's a long time ago, actually. But um, this is yeah still relevant. It's still, um, I would say, the main architecture for image classification. I mean, not this particular architecture, but the convolutional neural network architecture in particular. I think this one is actually called Lenet 5. There might be other variants of Lenet 5, and I will yeah, also show you um, how to implement that in PyTorch and how to apply it to MNIST. But uh, yeah, let's focus on the big picture here first. So here, um, the authors used input images handwritten digits similar to MNIST. So here's an example of how they look like. And the goal back then was, yeah, here in that case, handwritten zip code recognition. And the inputs were 256 times 256. Um, I think that's 16 by 16, smaller than MNIST. And you can see, like I showed you on the previous slide, there are these image patches or these patch regions that are analyzed. And you can see um, what is going on here is that, well, what's illustrated is that pixels from this patch region go into here into some, or become a pixel in the next layer. So if you have multiple layers like um, input, hidden layer one, hidden layer two, hidden layer three, and then here the output, then you can see there is always a patch that is analyzed and it goes into the next layer and the same thing is going on here. So in that way, there's some feature extraction going on. And in fact, also this um, is only yeah, a static image. What you would do is you would slide this patch here over the image. So you would start in the left corner and then move it to the right and so forth. So you essentially move this, um, you move this around like this from left to right and then from top to bottom. Um, but this will become clear. I will show you, of course, additional yeah, illustrations where this will be more, I would say, clear. Here, this is a very old figure and some things are maybe not so easy to see here. Um, another thing, for instance, to highlight here is that um, there are two, two of these and actually, in fact, there are 12. So then they are dotted between. So there would be 12 of these um, so-called yeah, feature maps 
And let me just maybe forward because I have another illustration of the same architecture that is a little bit more clear. Yeah, so here's another illustration of that architecture, except that yeah, the inputs are a little bit larger. They are 32 by 32. It's from a slightly newer paper where they apply this to document recognition instead of just zip code recognition. So here this also includes letters and not only digits. But here again, the same concept applies. And I think this is a little bit easier to, yeah, to interpret. And this is, yeah, this is the Linet 5. And I will show you a code implementation in PyTorch. I yeah, just implemented that also in code. So um, what's going on here is essentially that we have these what we call convolutions, this operation where you take a patch from the input and then project it up to here. And how this is computed, I will of course explain it to you. For now, just assume somehow these pixels get um, summarized into a single pixel which goes into the next map. These are the so-called feature maps. So here I have one, two, three, four, five, six, six of these feature maps, that's this number here, and the input is 32 by 32, and if I do this, if I start in the left corner, then compute the first um, pixel here, and then I move this by one pixel to the right, and then compute the next pixel here, and then I move this again to the right and compute the next pixel, my output would be 28 by 28, because that's just because of the cutoff, because if the kernel here, in this case, is 3 by 3, or I think it might be actually bigger, you cut off something on the left and on the right-hand side. But this is a detail that we will um, discuss um, in a later video. I think this is actually a 5 by 5 kernel, then it makes sense, yeah. So if we have a 5 by 5 kernel, we would, on each side, cut off two pixels. So we lose two pixels of the input, so which is why it's 28 by 28 and not 32 by 32. But again, we will discuss that in a future video, how exactly things got calculated and cut off. So here, the, just the big picture is that we go from the input to these feature maps, and then we go to another feature maps um, thing here, and another and another, and so forth. So we extract these feature maps, and what you can see is First of all, there is here a step where we add channels. So in fact, there are now six channels here. One, two, three, four, five, six. And we do that by using different different um, of these feature detectors. Let's call that a feature detector. And we have six of these feature detectors. In each feature detector, we slide over the image. So let's say we have this red feature detector that we slide over the image to produce this feature map. And then we do the same here with the green one. The green one would be another feature detector, and then it produces this feature map. And just assume we have six of these. And here there is a so-called subsampling operation. We will see later, this is also called max pooling. And here what we do is we just reduce the size. So this is like, so this first is the convolution. And the subsampling, you can think of it as, let's say, size reduction. And then again, we do another convolution. Now we have 16 feature maps. Then we do another subsampling, another size reduction, and then we end up with these here. And these here, they get now reshaped. So we can say reshape. And if you will see the code later, it will also become way more clear. So there's just a reshape operation to reshape that into a vector. And for instance, um, when we have this uh, reshaped one, we can then use a fully connected layer and another fully connected layer to compute the class labels, the outputs. So I illustrated this here in this slide. This is essentially the main, I would say, the main idea behind convolutional networks besides using these local filters. 
it's that we have an automatic feature uh, extractor. This is essentially the deep learning part about it. So instead of having a human manually um, extracting features from input images, there is now this automatic feature extractor, the convolutional layers. So the convolutional layers are doing automatic feature extraction that is learned by using backpropagation. And then in the end, part of the convolutional network is here this um, fully connected part, or you can think of it as the multi-layer perceptron part. And this is then essentially just like a classifier. So here, when it gets these um, fully connected, uh, sorry, the vector, the reshaped vector, this is essentially then here like a regular classification. And this is a feature vector that was automatically extracted using these convolutional layers. Yeah, and uh, each convolutional layer here, you can think of it as one hidden layer in this network. So if we are counting the number of layers, we have five networks, uh, five layers in this architecture. So the first convolution here, so that's the first um, convolutional layer here. The subsampling layer, it's essentially just, um, it's also sometimes called pooling. It doesn't have any weight parameters. So there's no real um, learning going on. So we usually don't count those as layers. We only count the layers that have weights. So, so in this case, first layer, second layer, the other convolution layer, and then we have one, two, um, two fully connected layers. So that's three, four. These are essentially hidden layers. And then we have this output layer. This is another one, it's our fifth layer. That's why the network here has five layers. Yes, yeah, so here is a, an annotation of everything I talked about in a previous slide. So um, yeah, the, this first number here represents the number of channels. Um, this, the second and third number represents the height and width, so the size, so let's say height and width. Like I said, this last part is a multilayer perceptron part. The subsampling nowadays is usually called pooling. And yeah, this, these are the so-called feature detectors. Nowadays, also, we call them kernels or filters. It really depends on kind of uh, who the author is and who, um, let's say, wrote the library. So some machine learning or deep learning libraries use the word kernel. Some use the term filter. And uh, nowadays, they are pretty much uh, interchangeable. I most often happen to use kernel, but I also recently um, try to use the fil a term filter. More often, it's a little bit more modern. Um, here, so one more uh, note about these Gaussian connections. So this is essentially um, what they did here is they used a fully connected layer together with a mean squared error loss. This was usually called a Gaussian connection. And uh, nowadays, yeah, as you know, in multilayer perceptrons, it's more, more common to use a fully connected layer with a softmax activation and the cross entropy loss. So here is a summary of the three main concepts behind convolutional networks. So based on what I just showed you in the previous slides, so there's one aspect that's the sparse connectivity. So that means that a single element in the feature map is connected to only a small patch of pixels, which is very different from fully connected neural networks. So just to illustrate what I mean again, so if I have my input image here, then I have my um, my feature maps here in the next layer. And we use these um, kernels, like I explained, so, so to essentially focus on a small region and then project this as a, let's say, activation into the next layer. That is what we do in the convolutional network. If you recall in the multilayer perceptron, we didn't have this sparse connectivity, we had a full connectivity. That means when we had an input image, we were usually reshaping it into a long vector, right? So this one here would become like a long vector. And then how this worked was for all the inputs, so the whole thing when became an activation in the next layer. So the whole 
maybe do this differently. So in the next activation, in the next layer, if this is our next layer, all the all the inputs were connected. So in that sense, it would be similar to using a kernel that has the same size as the whole image and then projecting it here, right? So if we had a full connection. So sparse connectivity, that's one aspect behind convolutional networks. But then there's also the aspect of parameter sharing. So what that means is that we use the same, exactly the same filter here or kernel or feature detector that we slide over the image. So once I compute this one here, I move it by one position to the right, let's say like this, and then I compute it for the, for the next position, but I'm not creating a new filter. I'm using the same filter and just move it by one position up to the right. So in that way, I'm doing a parameter sharing here. I'm reusing that. Again, in a multi-layer perceptron, we would have a completely different set of weights for each hidden activation, right? So for this uh, second one, I would have a completely new set of weights, which is not the case for the convolutional network. For the convolutional network, we just slide the same weights over by one position and reuse that. So this is why you can think of it as a very um, general purpose feature extractor that should work for all regions in that image. But um, yeah, what we have is we have multiple of these feature detectors, or we can have multiple, to produce these different feature maps, right? So there could be three feature maps, so I can have three of these filters, but for each feature map I'm reusing the same one that I'm sliding here. Yeah, and another aspect is that we have many layers. So when we do the convolution here, we construct feature maps and we do this many, many times. And over time, this is essentially over many layers. Usually what we do is we um, create more channels when we go from one to the next layer. And um, this is essentially to extract patterns. And you will s I will show you an example later. What effect that Hauser has is that it is basically essentially trying to extract local patterns from the global ones. So you have a big picture. Um, uh, I mean, big in terms of the size of the picture is re relatively large, but then yeah, over over the course over the training, it will from this global picture extract local images, so information about the eye and the nose and things like that. So it will instead of just regarding this whole thing as one image, it will then have one feature map that um, represents, let's say, eye and one that represents nose and so forth. So in that way, it's learning these um, more local patterns from this global image. Okay, so this was really the big picture overview. Um, I can imagine there was a lot of new stuff going on in this video, so things might be unclear. Instead of maybe re-watching this video, I recommend you maybe for now to keep going and watch the next video because I will go into a little bit more detail about the convolutional filters and the weight sharing. And I think this might clarify some questions you have. And if things are still unclear after that, then maybe revisit these two videos. But right now I would say, uh, if things in this video were unclear, keep going before you rewatch this one because the next video really might clarify some things.